It was a, a very good feeling. All the kids were here and all the mothers and fathers. It was a right kind of family atmosphere day. You can obviously see that for the photographs that were out. And everybody just rose to the occasion, you know. It was really a splendid day. You know the celebrities uh, from the kind of show business and then you the top sports people. Because you just Sandy Jardins, you're Danny McGrange, you're Derek Johnsons. All these guys yeah. uh, were down there as well, your comedians. As Stevie said, Jimmy Tarbuck, Kenny mm -hmm. Lynch, Johnny Beatty. Well, you've seen Dick, some of the photographs. Dickie, he Dickie Henderson, all these yeah. guys, you know. And again, people will not know these names just now, but at that time, they were, they were pretty big, extremely big. There was people queuing up for ages for autographs, you know, and you could see people in the crowd all pointing everybody out, there's so-and-so, there's so -and -so, Eric Sykes, there's Bruce Forsyth. You know, there was people in, in the crowd were just so excited to see that such big names had come to their town um, to, to play on, on their golf course. And uh, it was, it was, a, it was a big event. There was a lot of excitement um, around. You, you could actually feel it. You say to anyone, you want to hear you know, a nice bit of history about Glasgow, and they're like, mm, don't know. You say to anyone in Glasgow, do you want to hear a good story? And immediately you've got them. <laughs> and that's what Lost Glasgow does. It says, do you want to hear a good story? Here's some pictures as well. <laughs> Renfrew Golf Club was established in September 1894 by a group of local businessmen from Renfrew and Govan. The ladies section was established the following year. In 1920 uh, the course was extended to an 18-hole course. We moved to our current location in 1973 and we've been here ever since. I was working with a chap called Jim Finlay who was involved in the club here and he was involved in the setting up of the, the event, um, the Saints and Sinners event, which was the, the club members and um, it was a charity, so it was club members and celebrities. We were first approached in 1976 by the Variety Club of Britain for running this prestigious event and uh, with various meetings, Joe Gibson was the captain at that time. Jimmy Geddes was the vice captain of the club. So they attended various meetings and it was finalised that we would finally have this year. Proximity was very good because of the airport, also the hotels in the surrounding area, easy access coming off the aircraft in the morning, easy to get here to go out and play golf. He knew I was a keen photographer and he was involved in the, the setting up the event here. So he said to me, you fancy coming along and taking some pictures and maybe giving us some prints after the event so I said yeah that, that would be great you know I was um, when I was younger I was a lot more daring um, and I, I would eventually get into places I shouldn't be to take pictures but this was an invitation that I couldn't refuse so yeah I came down on the day and it was absolute bedlam there was so many people around um, uh, there was a lot more celebrities turned up than I thought there would be um, but Jim had got me access to all areas, you know, the, the locker rooms, um, the, the, the greens that were practising on, all that sort of stuff. So I managed to just wander around uh, with my, my camera and, uh, you know, take pictures of the celebrities, but also try and get some of the people in the background in, uh, some of the, the, the people from Renfrew that had come to see the event. But um, oh, it, was, it was a huge event. You know, and some of the some of the people that were there were, you know, A-listers of the day, and really were. Peter worked with me in the Rolls Royce. I was my apprentice in the Rolls Royce at the time of inspection, and I thought it was a good opportunity to get them down here, you know, and get some of their expertise in the photographs, as you could see. When you think of people like uh, James Hunt, I mean, James Hunt was the Lewis Hamilton of of his time. You know, he was he was a bit of a playboy, and he was a very larger than life character. Um, and, you know, I, I took some pictures of him in the bar here, you know, and he was 
he was just, you could feel his presence, you know, and everybody was looking at him. Um, Tarbuck was there, Jimmy Tarbuck, huge at the time. Henry Cooper, world champion boxer. Um, you, you know, you had you had all sorts. You had um, Sean Connery, you know, he was here. It was very strange. It was like watching my childhood in front of me. The likes of Larry Marshall, you know, the guy who fronted up the one o'clock gang, you know, that was a staple for everyone back in the day. Bruce Forsyth on your television every Sunday night in the Palladium. And here they all were in front of us, you know, just uh, playing golf and having a good time. No, it was it was, it was was quite an exciting time. I was in charge of the house, which is basically within the, the clubhouse. Running the bar, the catering facilities, and the general tidiness, cleaners, and the dress code within the, the club as well, you know. Mr Hunt arrived uh, through the side door. He didn't come in the normal way. James approached it from outside the club because of the crowds that were here. They had an opening there. So James came in that way with his T-shirt and his clubs. And uh, everybody was kind of dressed up with a Sunday vest and that, you know. So James came in. He was a millionaire, as you know. He just had a T-shirt. And there was a kind of hole in the back of the T-shirt, a tear on it. That's the way millionaires dress right enough, isn't it? <laughs> Very discreet. <laughs> That's how they've got money. That's correct. <laughs> you know, people like Johnny B. were there, and he was playing up to the crowd. And sadly, we lost Johnny recently. But he was a character, you know, and the crowd loved him. Um, but Brucey, he was more—he was more serious. He was taking it a bit more serious. Um, but there was there was, you know, lots going on on the day, and moving from green to green, you know, trying to get as many of them in as I can, you know, so it was, it was an exciting day. 1977, I would have been 20 years old. I had just finished my apprenticeship in Rolls-Royce. Photography was something that I had been in my family. Uh, my father was a keen photographer. This is the camera that um, I was using back in those days. It's a, a Zenith E, it's, it was made in Russia and it's, it's very, very heavy. It's a full metal construction. But the good thing about this was it's a great camera to learn your craft on because if you look at the top, you've, you've got to manually set your ASA, your, um, your shutter speed, and in the front, um, there's, what you had to do was effectively open up this ring at the front, take your exposure reading here, convert that to your f-stop or your shutter speed, focus, and then you had to shut the ring down at the front now you could imagine trying to do that to catch a grab shot and it was very difficult. So you had to learn things like zone focusing where you know, you're know you using calculations to make sure that at what aperture for what size of lens, everything from say four feet to infinity is going to be in focus. So you had 36 shots or 24 shots depending on the size of film that you had in there. So it wasn't like today where you can set your camera phone on burst mode and take 30 pictures and choose the best one. I had to get the picture right every time. In my early days of photography, I did virtually everything in black and white because it was accessible. And it meant I could process my own films. I could overexpose, underexpose, push, pull, processing, all that sort of thing. Um, and it gave me a bit more control. Uh, and it, it's, it was very, very rewarding. It's very rewarding when you wash a film at the end of the process and you pour out the water and then take the spiral out with the negatives around it and you see that they've got the proper contrast and density and it's it's very, very rewarding. If you look at the, the camera that I use now, um, the, the Fuji X-T3, um, it's got similarities to the it's got similarities to the old Zenith where a lot of the information is on the top and you can actually... And the beauty of these things now is that it's basically what you see is what you get um, rather than back in the day where you're taking the picture and hoping you've got the, the calculations right with the exposure. So yeah, it's a lot easier these days with these cameras, but at the same time, you need to know the difference between f2 and f16. You know, you need to know the difference between 15th of a second and 500th of a second and getting that balance right, the relationship between the two. We being captain, Kenny was vice captain, so we get the chance to, to pick who we wanted to caddy for. So that's how it all started off. For me, it was Sean Connery. He was actually probably the, the biggest name there at the time. 
right. because he, he, I don't know if he just finished Bond, it was just coming to the end, but he was in a lot of films, big star, Hollywood, all that sort of thing. So that was mm -hmm. fair. And I get, uh, James Hunter, nowadays, could you imagine that scenario? People would probably bid tens of thousands of pounds to actually caddy for could a Formula caddy for them? World Champion yeah. Racing yeah. Driver. And again, you're, as Steve is probably quite, what, Daniel Craig coming down? Well, could you imagine, the, <laughs> imagine the crowds? Because <laughs> I had, uh, when we were playing, there was three females, well, three young yeah. females yeah. following James Hunt yeah. because it was James Hunt. And that was it, yeah. you know? But there was there was a lot of other guys, a lot of kind of it really was you know top notch celebrity for the UK because within the group with uh, Sean Connery, I had Jimmy Tarburk, you know, he was top of his game at the time, and uh, Henry Cooper. Sean drives off the first hole, hits a good shot. Sean knew. Oh, Sean. aye, my very close friend, <laughs> hits a good shot. Get down there, I'm chanking along with the clubs behind him. And then he turns round to me, just out of the blue, he's hardly said a word for me, a word to me at this point. He says, well, what do I play here? And it was like an instruction, it wasn't even an ask. And I'm, I've not got a clue why he's got to play here. So I kind of fumbled out some sort of club and eventually got it on the green. Uh, so we managed to get through that. The third hole was quite a good one. It was, it's a par three down here and there was a lot of crowd around. It was quite, quite busy to say the least. And there was a guy called Ron McLean. And he turned, Sean had turned round to me again and said, right, well, what do I play for this? And I'm kind of, oh, God, I don't really know what you should play, blah, blah, blah. And this guy, Ron McLean, shouts out, hit a five iron, five iron's a club for you. He never knows who he is or anything like that. So the ball, Sean, he gets a five iron, hits, and he's not too sure if it's the right club or not. He thinks, oh, God, I'm, I think I might be going through the green with this. Hits the perfect shot, 30 yards through the green. <laughs> And he turned round to this guy, Ron McLean, as if he was Blofeld or something like that. <laughs> that evil stare, and Ron, he's chanking away from it. So you never spoke to you after that? No, did. no. I, I get the blame for that as well. Aye, aye. James Hunt, well, he turned up, and again, Formula One racing, well, world champion. I think uh, he did have a hangover. Well, he turned up in jeans and a t shirt on, crew neck t shirt on, which is kind of frowned upon. And not only that, it was torn. And you ain't a guy with a bit of money. And his back pocket, he turned up kind of spruce. But the guy was absolutely brand new. He was great with me, absolutely a total gentleman the whole way around. Now you're talking a guy, again, get back to that third hole that Steve was talking about, just a par 370 yards. And again, he had a nine iron. He was saying, right, okay, if I've got that yardage. So you've got a guy, a Formula One racing driver, his wrists were enormous from the driving. Because again, I don't know what the cars are like nowadays, but. You imagine the power that they needed to get around a racetrack. But it was absolutely brand new. Half decent golfer as well. He did swear about the number of trees that we had in the course at the time as well. And uh, not going round, absolutely spot on. The only entourage that we had following us was three teenage girls. Was that for you? No, nah, it might have been for no. me, I know. But uh, so that The was, choice uh, of you or the world racing James, champion. It was, close, yeah. it was a close call. So, no, again, so James Hunt, absolutely brand new. 1960, I joined the golf club and been a member ever since. It looked like golfers coming up there. Oh, it was a great, great occasion. The only thing was uh, Bruce Forsyth. He he was on the first tee. He turned around to a couple of girls. They paid a couple of pounds to get in. And he turned around to them and said, why don't you go and watch some old movies or something, you know? Because they were talking. Terrible. Bruce Forsyth, he was in our group, and again, he's, he's all spruced up. He's got the cardigan on, the wee fancy hat uh, as well. And again, we come up, I think we were a wee bit slow, kind of coming up to the seventh. And somebody, typical one of the council, come up and one of the golf club, could, could you maybe hurry it along a bit? He was raging. He was absolutely loving. I've gave up my time to come down here and you're telling me to hurry up. So he wasn't too happy at that. But at that time he was getting the odd shout, oh. nice to see you, to see you nice. And I, I remember Jesse Valentine saying to him, does that not annoy you? And he just said, it's just part of the, yeah. the kind of package yeah. that yeah. goes with it, with the job type of thing. The old Bruce was a wee bit kind of, a wee bit kind of snobbish, I think, you know. But basically the rest of the people all enjoyed in the spirit of the day. There wasn't any controversy as far as the, the playing of the general day went, you know. Brian Barnes was the one. He came to the seventh hole 
had marked his, his ball with a beer can. Uh, these are wee things you might remember. I've got a quick wee story at one of the tees that comes back to me. Um, the bold Henry, he smacks it off the Henry tee. Cooper. Yeah. And his actual tee for the ground spins up near. And Sean's going to, he's going to tee up next. So he sees Henry's tee in pockets. <laughs> And Henry's looking round for his tea. I'm saying, oh God, I can't shop him like this. And so it just shows you, you know, why do that? Sean, you know, Sean the Scott. Oh, he's some boy. Because we're waiting at the end. We were hoping to get like wee souvenirs or even some dosh or something like that. And everybody was getting weighed in with money and you can take gloves, you can take balls, all that. Sean, nowhere. So I'm waiting about in the, the locker room for ages and ages <laughs> and eventually I have to end up kind of cornering him and he says, eh, well, I've not got a lot of money just now, son. <laughs> There's two quid in him. <laughs> two quid. No, we spent five hours out in the golf course. Exactly. Taking all the abuse was, and all okay, that. It was 77. Two you quid know, wasn't a lot. Billionaire by that at point. That particular time. <laughs> and so, again, with me with James Hunt, when we came off the course, he took it. And it must have been in his golf bag, actually. He took out a big wad of notes that was all rolled up and just, well, it was a fiver. There you go, son, just for, for helping us out today, you mm. know, so no issues. It's quite an experience for, you know, for us as young I guys it, as well. It's difficult to say at the time that you, well, I don't think you realise at the time how how big it was, if you, if you know what I mean, you know. At night it was, I mean, we had our own wee dance down here and all the stars had a function up in the Normandy Hotel. Where the captain and the vice captain were invited along with our good ladies for a, a function up there, you know. But we had our own special do down there, and that was quite a good night as well, I can assure you. You know, a lot of happy memories. I'm always looking for interesting old Glasgow stuff online, uh, and all of a sudden stumbled across Peter's work when he started publishing it. Uh, and just, I think it was his govern set, it was old govern set from the 1970s, and just brilliant street photography and pictures I'd never seen before. When I started out in photography, I, I preferred the photojournalistic or reportage or what they called it at that time. Um, we now call it street photography. But I, I liked that style of photography, photography, but you weren't really going to get anywhere if you're a member of a camera club or, you know, trying to sell your pictures. People weren't really interested in a lot of that at that time. Um, but I knew when I was taking those pictures that I was going to do something with them eventually because if I take, for example, the pictures I took in Govan, Govan was disappearing at a rapid rate and I wanted to capture some of that, so, so I did. But, you know, taking 36 shots um, is something that you've got to train yourself on um, to get, make sure you get the right pictures that you want. Peter wasn't a professional photographer. He's just a guy who enjoys taking pictures and was out doing it in his own time. And the wonderful thing is that 30, 40 years later, what was workaday just street scenes in Glasgow, all of a sudden you, you blow the dust off them and here's magic. Because it's pictures that pictures of things and places and people that other folk weren't taking because they thought were so normal. Uh, and yet Peter's caught them in an instant. And... There they are for all to see now. One of the pictures I took was um, a picture in Govan, and a, a woman contacted me and said that she'd never seen a picture of her dad um, just going about his business, and he died previously, you know, and she, she treasured that picture. And that's nice, that's rewarding. To me, that is rewarding, because I've given someone something that they can look at and get a warm feeling from. It's not highfalutin, it's not... Yeah, dictated history, it's not a list of names and dates, it's, it's memories. Uh, we've all got those, everyone's brought up with family stories. Uh, some of them half remembered or you know, completely forgotten and if you can poke somebody's memory muscle, all of a sudden they remember as well. You just need to look at some of the, some of the work that's um, available now through the internet, a lot of it is that small history. It's uh, fishing villages in Orkney and the pictures from St Kilda and all that sort of stuff. You know, local communities doing what local communities do. Um, I mean, I've got pictures on my website of the Penalty Gallery in 1970-something, I can't remember what it was. But then again, people go in and look at that and say, oh, that's me, that's so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, that's where 
community photography can be really valuable. You know, I often say to people, you know, like, you know, today's mundane as tomorrow's gold dust. And that comes across when you share some of this stuff with these people. I mean, even the, the, the pictures of the golf club, you know, that we, we were talking about, the, the people see themselves in the background. They unfortunately see people that are no longer with us, but they also see very young people that are now, you know, grey-haired. So it's, it's good for that. I mean, that was a very local event which had to be recorded, um, and thankfully I did that. Um, in the scheme of things, it's not, um, it's not going to you know, make the headlines or anything, but it is a social history of a part of Renfrew when the, the showbiz stars of the world came here and then went away again, and it's been recorded. It's only when history becomes personal that you actually become involved in it, whether it's family history, the stories that your parents told you. Uh, I grew up with a a very elderly grandfather who was born in 1888 and went to sea aged 14 under sail and had been four times round the world before he was 21 uh, and then sailed out to Clyde for 30 years and walking about Glasgow with him when I was yon high that was an education because he knew every building he could tell me what every building was and where he used to sign on for his ship and where he used to go and get his sailor's gear and you know, I you know, used to board there and you know, we'd be off to the Eastern Mediterranean for six weeks. And all of a sudden, what is just basically bricks and mortar start, starts to breathe. It's very important that we keep that social history going. Um, we make it accessible to people um, so that they can see it and learn from it. And I think that, I think that in a way it starts to build up our perception of what photography is. It's a very valuable tool to record life today for people coming tomorrow to have a look at it. Nobody these days tends to download or print off their photographs. Uh, so whereas you know, you're clearing out your granny's house and you'll find a, a stash of old photographs of friends and relatives and you can't put names to them all. You know, 20 years from now when you clear out somebody's house you'll find old phones with memory cards. Will you even be able to access the memory cards? Will you even bother? to go and have a look and see what folk have taken photographs of. The other worry, of course, is that you will, you'll find old memory cards and think, brilliant, and you'll put them in your computer and you'll find 3,000 selfies and 500 pictures of somebody's dinner. <laughs> you know, there are good photographs and there are bad photographs, but at the end of the day, the photographs, you know, what, what um, I was looking at back in the day, people were thinking, that's boring, that's just a picture of Govan Road. But it's gold dust now. You know, a lot of people get a lot of pleasure from looking at those photographs because nostalgia is big business. And, um, you know, and that was me just keeping taking photographs, you know. And once you learn the basics of your camera, it feels second nature to you and you go out and take photographs. You, you'll have bad ones, that's okay, you know, but you'll have some really good ones in there. I don't know if a lot of these people now have got the same you know, kind of enthusiasm for doing charity events like that, you know. I don't, I don't really know now if that, but it's a great thing if they could to get, assemble all these big celebrities. I mean, you only got to look at that list there and, I mean, that was all the top names in British showmanship at that time, you know, that appeared and dedicated their time to that event.